Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next episode of the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Now today we are celebrating the publication of the second edition of A Philosopher's Take on Economics by John Tippett. Now John has been both a student and teacher of economics and philosophy for over 40 years and I've been able to read an advanced copy of the second edition and it's excellent. Why it's so good and worth your money and most importantly your time will I hope become clear in this conversation. Now for convenience we've split it into two episodes. In episode one we get into how John became an economist philosopher and why economic philosophy is fundamental to the practice of economics and yet is hardly if ever discussed and so is invisible to most of us. And in episode two we look at why economics is so flawed and why it doesn't get better and we look at how to apply the lessons in John's terrific book that is applying practical economic philosophy to our daily lives. So without further ado let's get into the conversation. My guest today is John Tippett, who is author of A Philosopher's Take on Economics, and we're very excited to be publishing the second edition of this book. And now John's got over 30 years of experience as an economic lecturer. Um, He has a PhD in economics from RMIT in uh, Melbourne. Um, He's worked at the University of Melbourne and at Monash. Um, He grew up, though, on a farm in northwest Victoria, and that's one of the things that formed his experience, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Um, He lives um, in Melbourne with his lovely wife, Jennifer, and I think he's still a member of the School of Philosophy in Melbourne. John, um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. So, John, um, before we get going, what? so the first question is your your book's called A Philosopher's Take on Economics. Um, What the hell is a philosopher doing writing a book about economics? (laughs) <laughs> well, the, the philosophy I'm, I'm interested in, Jonathan, and have been interested in for 40 years now, uh, has to do with life and the purpose of life and the betterment of life and the fulfilment of the human purpose. And economics has a vital part to play in that fulfilment of the human purpose. In particular, it has a vital part to to play, or it should have, in the ordinary business of men and women worldwide simply of making a living. So the two, that is philosophy and economics, are intimately woven, interwoven, in in my view, and... uh, in other words, economics, without talking about people and and the well-being of people uh, and 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 their uh, ability to to simply exist in the material world, to make a living, to develop and express their talents, are vital aspects of human development, absolutely vital the fundamental, and that's what economics is really meant to be facilitating. So because of my interest in in both philosophy and economics, Jonathan, it it seemed to me appropriate to to adopt that title, a philosopher's take. Uh, The word take, of course, is in inverted commas. It's to indicate to the reader of the book where I'm coming from. Really, that's the point, or at least to make an attempt on my part to indicate to the reader where I'm coming from, what is my stance, in, in, in another way, why have I written the book? And, and so when you, when you talk about weaving together economics and, and philosophy, I, I, I know your, your, your qualifications as an economist. Um, what, how did you get into philosophy? Oh, that's a big question, Jonathan. <laughs> it's probably the biggest question of life, really. <laughs> and, right. uh, you, you might ask that question of everybody. <laughs> uh, but how did I? When, when in, in my early years, um, Jonathan, and by early, I, I mean my teen years, 
And then all the way through my 20s, I, I was, um, I'm not quite sure how to put this, but but I would say I, I was always uh, aware that, that ordinary common life, if I can use that expression, there had to be more to life, to the meaning of life, to the purpose of existence than just that. that than just going through life, getting my training in my job, doing my job, uh, marrying children, this, that and the other thing. There just was this, you might say, nagging sense in me that there had to be more to it and there was more to it and that I kind of had a determination to find out what that might be. So, Jonathan, there was a very, you might say, extensive search on my part, um, which um, wasn't always easy. It, 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 uh, it, it was troublesome, you might say. Uh, but anyhow, it... it but what, what, it, it culminated in my stumbling across what, what is still called the Melbourne School of Philosophy. And I remember vividly back in 1978 reading a tiny little advertisement in one of Melbourne's prominent weekend newspapers advertising a forthcoming course in practical philosophy and it was a 12-week course. I think the cost of it was something like $12. <laughs> and uh, the, the 12 weekly topics were listed, and they included consciousness, the meaning of life, the power of attention, and so on. And I That's was a good deal for 12 books, Johnny. <laughs> 12 weeks, yes, yes. <laughs> And I, I was sceptical, frankly, Jonathan. I was sceptical because I had done so much reading in the intervening or, or immediate preceding years leading up to this point and had still not found any proper answer mm. that I hardly believed the advertisement. But two things swayed me, <clears throat> Jonathan. One, the course... The lectures were conducted in a major city of Melbourne church hall. Now, that indicated to me that this uh, group that were putting it on, not that I knew them, they had to be reasonable, otherwise they wouldn't be in a church hall. <laughs> so that was the first thing. And the second thing was I said to myself, look, if, if a quarter of what they are uh, advertising turns out to be true, this course will be very, very good. <laughs> mm. So off I went. And that was in 1978. Now, it, uh, my intention then, of course, was a 12-week course. That's what was advertised, a short course, 12 weeks. Mm. I'd complete the 12 weeks and... Uh, then we'd see. But the introductory course led on to what was called Part 2, Philosophy Part 2. That led to Philosophy Part 3. By the way, the School of Philosophy still offers this sequence. Um, and it just went on and on and on. And here I am, well, it's over 40 years later, Jonathan. Uh, still interesting. And what do you think, what did that course give you that, that all you were the searching hadn't done? What did it give me? Yeah, I mean, because you said that you'd been searching for a long time and yeah. you were sceptical about finding anything anything new. But clearly yeah. it must have been because it kept you interested for the last 40 years. Oh, definitely, definitely. I'll, I'll never forget a critical incident in the course, Jonathan, it was roughly two-thirds of the way through. And to be frank, I had very nearly walked out of the course after week two. 
But during about weeks, roughly six or seven of the course, I remember the presenter making a statement. He, he was reading a, a pre-prepared material, but, but in a very uh, engaging manner, I might say. And the statement he read out, Jonathan, to my memory was, the natural condition of the mind is silence. The natural condition of the human mind is silence. Now, when I heard that, Jonathan, I nearly did you have, in. Did you have a voice in your head going, what is he talking about? Silence? Is that... <laughs> That's exactly what happened, Jonathan. And oh dear, it took some restraint to just say, stay seated. <laughs> uh, the lecturer was uh, the presenter at the time. He struck me as very unapproachable, uh, a bit smug, um, three piece suit, and shiny hair, and. <laughs> I thought, look, mate, I'm out of here. <laughs> you convinced me. <laughs> but by the grace of God, Jonathan, I stayed seated. And about, I don't know how many minutes later, maybe only one or two, it occurred to me, or at least the thought came into my mind, he's talking about a possibility I may not be experiencing that condition now, in, uh, that is silence, and peace and silence. I was experiencing the opposite, but here was a possibility. And that, that was it. Mm. That, that was the, as they say, Jonathan, the clincher. And if that was a possibility, I was going to really look into it. Into it, and, and you might say, Jonathan, what, what we've been talking about for the past two or three minutes, this peace and silence of the mind being the natural condition is a very big aspect of the whole point of practical philosophy. Mm. Well... 40 years further on, Jonathan, <laughs> at least I know what that piece is at times. <laughs> and what, what's your experience now? Is the natural state of the mind silent? Well, it, 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 it's certainly not silent all the time, Jonathan. It, mind does its thing. Uh, it, it, it gets erratic, it gets busy, it gets noisy. It chatters, uh, the mind I'm talking about. Uh, but, but there are fairly long periods I find in life now. By long period, I mean it can be hours on end where my experience, I would have to say, is one of peace. Just yeah. good, simple contentment. So... Jonathan, you might say it, it, it's at this very point that we're talking now, peace of mind, contentment, simplicity. This is where economics is so vital as, as a subject because peace of mind and contentment and the sense of purpose and well-being are impossible if you're hungry. Well, they're all but impossible. They're impossible or all but impossible if you're unemployed. They're impossible, peace of mind and contentment, or they're all but impossible if you're completely discontent with your way of life or, or more the point, if you're finding it one hell of a struggle. If a man and woman, a married man and woman, are both having to flog away 40 hours a week at a job just to pay the interest bill on the mortgage, how can you then and, and, and face the uncertainty of unemployment, face the uncertainty of rising interest rates, 
Mind you, they've done the opposite in the last several years. But all of these kinds of economic things have a very big effect on the mind because they're to do, they impinge directly on everyday life. Yeah. And that's why economics is so important. So that's the reason, Jonathan, in, in short, for the, the combined interest of philosophy and economics. And there is a philosophy of economics. It's just that it's unspoken. Yeah. So the yeah. question is, what is that philosophy and why is it unspoken? Um, yeah. And that then can transform the conversation, can't it? And it can, and then you can say, well, actually, we are. It's not. It's not this one. It's not just you saying we should have philosophy. You're actually the books. You know, economics shows there is a philosophy. It's just it's a dismal one, and it yeah. you know, it benefits all, but the, like even it impoverishes everybody, right? Because even even someone who wins in in the game of economics as it's currently set up is miserable and isolated. Um, and worries for their safety, right? And they, yeah. I, I live near near one of the biggest compounds for billionaires in the UK, and um, and they have security guards, and they have, you know, yeah. some of the guys they can't, they they have a, they have everything in these houses. There's literally yeah. everything that someone could need. They've got bowling alleys, they've got cinemas, they've got obviously swimming pools, everything else, because the security risk for leaving yeah. the property. Is so yeah. great. It's like, well, we'd rather spend a million on a bowling alley in a cinema than yeah. worry about you going off site because someone's going to try and kill you when you leave. And it's like, well, yeah. where's the, where's the freedom in that? Right? Yes, Johnny. If I could, can I? I just want to go to a part in the book you quote Thoreau. Um, are you okay if I read the if I read the quote? Oh yes. Um, and you you talk about um. This is in the chapter on um, economic freedom, the forgotten state, which yes. again, just stunningly good chapter. Um, and so, and this is what Thoreau said, to be a philosopher is not merely to have subtle thoughts, not even to found a school. And I think that that's possibly the view that we've got of philosophy and that it's mostly irrelevant. Right, and I think yes. your argument is it's absolutely pivotal. It's, it's, it's in fact, it's essential that you have a sense of what your philosophy is, right? Um, but to carry on, um, so, it, so to have subtle thoughts, not even to found a school, but to love wisdom as to live according to its dictates, a life of simplicity, independence, magnanimity, and trust. It is to solve some of the problems of life, not only theoretically, but practically. And yeah. I, I love that. I mean, it was it was later on in the book when I when I read it, obviously. Um, but I think that's really what you're trying to do with economics, isn't it? Is that it's meant to you, what you want is for economics to be able to solve our problems as in our as in human beings. Um, and that's one of your fundamental points in the book, I think, isn't it? Is that is that economics is meant for us. It isn't meant for the economy or for some that we've all got to work to grow the economy it's like well for what what's the point of that i wonder if we can if we can move on to onto that now really and and just look at your your education as an economist because i'm thinking that so in, in 78 you have this revelation um and you get hooked into this uh, an approach on practical philosophy so when did economics and philosophy start to come together the formal training in economics jonathan which went really for quite a while. You might say it started with my diploma in agricultural science. Uh, I know that doesn't sound much like economics, but the, the three-year diploma in agricultural science uh, certainly talks about the economics of farming. So you might say the formal training started with that, uh, with that uh, diploma course. Then I went on to the uh, University of Melbourne with the Bachelor of Commerce, majoring in economics. And Jonathan, that course, that, that period of study nearly sent me right round the bend. <laughs> it, it was like 
the few weeks leading up to week six in that uh, practical philosophy course, uh, a lot of it was dreadful, very difficult to put up with. Um, part of the little bit of sensibility that came into my commerce degree course was accounting studies, which uh, I, I did, my second major was accounting. Mm. They were called majors then. You had your first major um, and, and second. Accounting lent a wee bit of stability and normality to the course uh, in, 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 in economics. The theoretical studies were largely dreadful, Jonathan, dreadful. Oh, well, they were so far off practical reality. Yeah. They had nothing to do with life. Half of them were mathematical, which is a part of the reason economics has become so disreputable. The, the, the practice of, of reducing economics to mathematical formulae. Now, mathematics is, is beautiful. I love a bit of it, but it doesn't help in economics. So the, the, my early studies, uh, as I've, I've said now, Jonathan, in, in my formal training was very unpleasant. But somewhere along the line... <laughs> so we kind of just... So, John, well, I'm, I'm starting to see a trend here. Right. So, so you, you start a you start a course of study. You find it deeply frustrating. You want to at times you want to punch the lecturer, or at least walk out. And yet your answer to that is to stay forty years in in the case of philosophy, and then and then say like so economics is a load of rubbish. I know I'll do a PhD in it. <laughs> I love your summary, Jonathan. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, when are you going to write your book? Or, or what, what, what is it and what will be its title? <laughs> uh, now, this, this will make sense in a moment, Jonathan, because at, as it stands now, you're, you're looking at a complicated old guy who <laughs> you, no one can fathom him out. <laughs> okay, well, at some time in my 20s, and I really don't remember exactly how old I was, I think I must have been around about 25. So therefore, I had nearly finished my four-year economics degree. Um, I, I used to have a, a, a habit, Jonathan, a peculiar little habit of walking around the city of Melbourne, just looking at, up at buildings and so on, and, and in the back of my mind was trying to find a little, tiny little place to live upstairs above a shop somewhere. That, that was a little uh, idiosyncrasy that, that played out in those years. And one day I was in a lane, it's called Hardware Lane, right in the centre of the CBD. And in the lane was a little shop and it looked interesting and it was called the shop front was the shop front of the Henry George League. That's what it was called then, the Henry George League. And I don't know, I don't remember, Jonathan, what, how or why I went in there other than it attracted me. They did have some books on display in the window. Anyhow, I went in and some dear man I, I called him then some dear, very old man, and he was probably my age, <laughs> my current age now, I mean. <laughs> he gave me this book, Progress and Poverty, the Henry George. Yeah. So naturally I took it home and read it. And, Jonathan, that 
that was the second, I beg your pardon, that was the first really big, big shift in my mind when I read Henry George, particularly his Savannah story, yeah. which is the explanation of how with progress, with economic progress, wealth concentrates. He showed me how and why it concentrates. And that was a revelation. Now, I met that, I met, you might say, I met Henry George before meeting practical philosophy. Got it. So you put those two together, Jonathan, yeah. And they were profound influences in my latter 20s. And then, of course, on into my 30s. If you could discover Henry George at that age, you could want to study economics again. Because that's actually, he makes the point of why you ought to study economics, I think. Well, but I'd studied it beforehand. I'd, I'd almost finished my degree before yeah. I came yeah. across Henry George. After finishing the degree, Jonathan, a, a period of, I might say, difficulty um, was my lot. I didn't fit easily into employment. I probably had two or three different jobs. All of them were good. All, I'm, I'm saying that now when I look back. Um, but I left all of them. I got involved in a practical farming uh, venture uh, that turned out badly, not, not technically but financially badly. So I finished up, you might say, Jonathan, in, in not a very good position. And this was when I was about 30 or maybe even 31 or 2 let's say 30. So I had to get a job. I had to. And just like I opened the, pay, the paper one weekend and saw that advertisement for philosophy, I opened the paper and saw a little advertisement for a tutor, an economics tutor. Now, I didn't want to do it, to be frank. But to also, to be frank with you, Jonathan, I was getting a bit desperate, so I took it. It was a part-time job as economics and statistics tutor at an institute called the Caulfield Institute of Technology, CIT, in Melbourne. It was the counterpart of RMIT out in the suburbs. It, it's now part of Monash University, and that's how I got into Monash. Anyhow, off I went, Jonathan, started tutoring, and from day one, I felt fantastic. This was something that I knew not only could I do and enjoyed and liked, but it, it had a sense of uh, coming home in a way. <laughs> And so that was the beginning of the teaching part of my life, which has continued unabated right up until only a year ago when I retired. Mm. Now, when you teach in, in the university environment, you, you must have a master's. You must have a master's degree, so I enrolled in that. Uh, completed a thesis on Henry George, it got knocked back. <laughs> it got tossed out, unaccepted, Jonathan, which was a bit of a worry to me. But anyhow, I ploughed on. Well, 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 hang on a second. So so um, what happened there? What, why did it get thrown out? Well... Uh, again, I've got to be honest, Jonathan. I, I, I think in modern day language, I was a little bit pushy in my thesis, my master degree thesis. 
<laughs> and I'd completely forgotten, I'd forgotten, to be frank, Jonathan, that my job in writing the thesis was that of a student. A student. And I, my mental attitude, and I realised all of this only later, I was telling my professor what he really needed to know. Uh, Do you get the point? Yeah. And so, so just, just to looking at that work, was the logic accurate? Sorry, that last bit, Jonathan? Was, it, was, your, was your argument coherent? Were you, I mean, oh, were yes. you right? Oh, yes. Oh, very. It was a beautiful, well, it was straight economic rent and price of land and all of that. Yeah. It was a very good thesis, but I was writing as a professor writing his 15th book. Love it. <laughs> In other Love words, it. as an established academic. Yeah. And I shouldn't have done that. Well, and, no, and it, so, I mean, because you've got to just tell the line, right? Oh, yes. And it cost me dearly. I had to start that course all over again, and I had to do what is called coursework, which means study individual subjects for a couple of years. More yeah. mathematics, more pain, more theory. <laughs> <laughs> But mixed in with all of that was one or two lovely professors that uh, sort of helped me get through the day. And uh, well, I mean, you know, I mean, Shepard Walwin published the corruption of economics, right? And and Mason Gaffney's um, forensic um, explanation of how Henry George has been has been expunged from university courses and and from economics. Um, it's just shocking. So it's no surprise that, that um, any topic on Henry George, even if you would have been, well, if you'd been out going approaching Henry George as a student of, of economics in a normal university, then you wouldn't have studied Henry George, right? Because okay. he's got all he's about is, you know, he, he's a single taxer. That's all he's about. Um, and he's got nothing valuable to say because economics has moved on. Yes, yes. You know, and that that section of your book, John, um, where you where you talk about George and what he was talking and what he was meaning, um, I've not seen anyone else link the ideas of Henry George to economic freedom the way that you've done. Yes, well, I'm too busy talking about the single tax. <laughs> <laughs> That's forgotten. You know, when when we finish our little talk uh, this morning, Jonathan, I'll send you a short paper that I think you'll love reading. It, it, and, and it's to do with what I've just said about how Henry George has been taken quite wrongly, namely he's been taken to be on about taxation. And that is a, a very big reason why he's, he's not accepted. Hmm. But I'll send you that. Well, you know what, and, and maybe, I think, I think if you're able, I think if you want to defeat someone's argument, right, but they're so popular that you can't, you can't defeat them totally, you have to let some of their stuff through, right? Which is exactly, and, and the way you describe how Adam Smith's work has been grossly distorted. Again, oh, yeah. just terrifically clear articulation of that, really nicely done. But, you know, he was too big and too important to ignore. So let's just let's just say that he was about specialization of labor. And let's talk about a pin factory. Yes, right? that's, it. <laughs> no. that's it. And that's exactly what I, oh, Adam Smith, the pin factory. Oh, bloody hell. Yeah. Specialization. Right. So and, you, like, well, actually, and I didn't I got a degree in economics and I don't think anyone mentioned that he wrote another book. Oh, that it was a clergyman. And that he wrote a theory of moral sentiment. No Correct. one was interested. No. And in, in it, he said to feel, to feel much for others and little for oneself, to restrain our selfish and indulge our benevolent affections constitutes the perfection 
of human nature. Mm. Yeah. Magnificent quote. And that was his real interest, Adam Smith. Yeah. Well, do you know, and there was there was this one in your book. Um, this disposition to admire and almost to worship the rich and the powerful and to despise or at least to neglect persons of poor and mean condition is a great and most universal cause of the corruption of our moral sentiments. Respect and admiration are due only to wisdom and virtue. Yes, well, there you are. Could this paper be available to um, the listeners as well? Would that be? Would you be willing to share that? Oh, yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. It, 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 by the way, it's not my paper. It's a paper that was given to me. I, I don't even remember who gave it to me, Jonathan. Written in the nineteen seventies by someone I've never heard of, and I still can't find him, uh, who explains why Henry George has never been accepted properly. Well, I think I think a lot of our listeners would absolutely love to read that. Thank you very much for listening. Now, following the recording, John did send me the paper he mentioned. So if you're interested in Henry George, then do check it out through the link to this podcast. Now, if for any reason the link isn't there, that will be for copyright reasons. So then you just need to contact us directly through the Shepherd Walwyn website and we'll send you a copy directly. Um, So be sure also to check out the next podcast with John when he goes into more detail about the contents of his book. And of course, remember to check the book out, A Philosopher's Take on Economics, a second edition available exclusively from Shepherd Walwyn Publishers. Until next time, keep reading.